been on. And he has learned so many valuable life lessons, which he relates to teams of people across the globe. He inspires people to step out of their comfort zone with his real life stories of thinking big, taking risks, perseverance, courage, and deep passion. Um, Pete empowers people to succeed, and he shows them what tenacity, grit, and extraordinary teamwork will do uh, with the will to win and to achieve. On a sideline, Pete had me going down Whitewater Rapids on a, on a craft once, and I don't do rapids. Um, and every time I got scared, people would say, Lou, Lou, look at me. And I'd go, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so he really can get me to go Whitewater rafting, he can get anyone to do anything. Um, Pete is a family man. He is married to an equally amazing and adventurous wife, Kim, who I'm very blessed to call one of my very best friends. Uh, they have an amazing daughter, Hannah, who's 14 years old. And if anyone is equipped to share lessons on what it means to overcome adversity, then really, that is Pete. Uh, few people have endured the harsh realities of nature at its toughest that Pete has, and triumphed. So it's really a great honor for me to welcome Pete here tonight. When I asked Lucille, um, you know, what she was going to say um, when she was going to introduce me, I gave her some key words, which I see you haven't used. Things like handsome, <laughs> things like that. Before I start, yes, a little bit of footage about what you're about to see um, this evening. and leaving those words out. <laughs> um, it's a great privilege uh, for me to be speaking at WEB again this evening. Um, I spoke to some of the younger folk um, at the school this morning, or this afternoon, and it's good to be back. Where's Kun? Kun, thank you very much. Is she here? Yeah. Kun, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak. Um, it's uh, an, obs uh, an absolute uh, pleasure to come and speak to you, and it's obviously a great honor to share some of my um, stories with you, and tonight's really about storytelling, and I kind of like to tell my stories from where they start, and generally speaking, on my expeditions, my story starts when I'm <coughs> leaving home for the last time before the beginning of any of my expeditions, and uh, it's kind of a scene that plays itself out over and over again every time I do one of these trips, and, and they vary in, in intensity as well. Uh, depending on what I'm doing and where I'm going. But try, I'm going to ask you a couple of times this evening again, try and picture the scene. So I live in South Africa in a place called East London. Um, it's part of South Africa that's called the Wild Coast. Very beautiful part of South Africa. It's on the East Coast. And whenever I leave home for the last time before the start of an expedition, I've usually got the last bit of equipment that I need um, to get to the beginning of the expedition stuff that we haven't been able to get there um, beforehand. And um, I'm sitting in my vehicle, in my pickup, and I have my beautiful wife Kim sitting next to me. You'll see pictures of her just now. I have my daughter sitting, Hannah, sitting just behind us. And in the back of the pickup, I've got my sled, my skis, or whatever it is that I, I need to get to the expedition. 
And while I'm reversing out, a couple of thoughts go through my mind. And the first one, I don't usually speak about. And uh, I think, I look at everything and I think, I wonder if I'm ever going to see this place again. Because that's kind of the nature of some of the journeys that I've been on. But most importantly, I turn around to Kim and I say, Kim, isn't this just so wildly exciting? Because the very next time you and I come back into this driveway together, the very next time, it's going to happen, two or three or four or how many months' time, the whole story is going to have unfolded. Yes, and I wonder what that story is going to be. And I knew that those stories were always going to be filled with amazing times. But then there's always that thought about, you know, what, what about the dark times? What about the storms? What about um, those times where things just, the challenges just seem to be too intractable? And I knew that those stories were going to be filled with harsh stories. But I've never known what they were going to be. So this evening as I go through my presentation to you, I kind of want you to think about your story. Because it doesn't matter what position we are in in life at the moment, it doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are. If you had to come back here in a year's time or five years' time or ten years' time, you're going to have a, stall, a whole story that needs to be told. We don't know what that story is. But I know for sure, for one thing, is that every one of us wants to tell a significant story, a successful story, a meaningful story. And there's certain things that we can put in place, and the things that I've learned in my expeditions, which I'm going to share with you this evening, and I've got such a short time to share it in, that I've put in place in my life so that I know that when I start a new venture, whatever it is, that if I put very specific things in place, I'm kind of guaranteed of being successful um, in the end. So what I often do um, with people is I explain that, that it's very easy for a professional adventurer to tell an audience that what they need to do is look for adventure in their lives, when that's what I do for a living. But uh, with the youngsters today, I was chatting to them, and I was just saying, we can take our life as an adventure, because it is an adventure. And if we can take those things and look at it positively like that, we'll be able to use the opportunities that come um, past our way. Um, but let me just show you what adventure has done for me. So adventure has allowed me to surround myself with an amazing group of and probably right at the top of that is Kim, my wife. Um, and this is her down there. And that's my daughter, Hannah. Um, and, and that's been probably one of the greatest things that I've got out of adventure. It's allowed me to share my stories. This is in Beijing last year um, with the BBAC, the Beijing Benz um, group. And it's allowed me to travel to some of the most beautiful, wonderful, rugged, and most awful parts of this planet. Um, it's enabled me to test myself physically and mentally in some of the, again, some of the most remote parts of this planet. Um, I have suffered much during my journeys um, in order to achieve them. I have cried. I have laughed hysterically. I've danced on some of the shores of Af Africa's great lakes, magical lakes. I've had conversations with God, and I have been stunned and stood in awe at his galactic outbursts. I have also stood in fear in some of his great storms. I've made friends with birds and had relationships with fish. Don't worry, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've trekked through some avatar-like forests in Central Africa. I've come face to face with some great adversaries and wild animals, polar bears, <gasps> mountain gorillas. <laughs> I've got lost in wonder, not physically lost, lost in wonder in the polar caps on our planet, the South Pole and in the North Pole. I've dared much and I've risked much. I've triumphed and I've failed. And there's much more I could say, but I'm going to leave it there. But I think the most important thing is that in everything that I've done, in every venture that I've embarked on, I've absolutely looked for the adventure in everything. And so, <clears throat> one of the greatest lessons that I've learned and one of the things that has helped me the most during my expedition is understanding the world that we 
are operating in. We know that climate change is having a huge and massive effect on our world. But our world around us is changing just as much as climate change is changing our planet. We operate in a, in a tough environment, uh, to say the least, super competitive. Um, it is often extremely harsh. Um, the youngsters are growing up in a world that we probably don't understand much of. By the time they are finished university, it's a completely different world to the one that we've grown up in. So, so given the circumstances that we're all actually operating our lives, our business lives, our personal lives, how do we achieve and sustain success in this drastically and dramatically changing environment? Um, so let's quickly try and work out that word success first of all. I know that if I had to go to each one of you right now and ask you what your definition of success was, I'd get, I don't know how many people here, a hundred different answers. So let me tell you from my perspective, just simply put, true success is being able to achieve the vision that you have for your life. And obviously underneath that it's really tiered and layered with other things. So Harvard Business School did a very famous study on success. It took successful people and successful businesses and they tried to find out what are the common characteristics that knit them together. So they could write an academic paper or a book on what success, success is. Um, and if you had to read that paper or read that book, you'd kind of be guaranteed, if you applied those principles to your life, you'd kind of be guaranteed a success in the end. And at the end of their study, their conclusion was that the secret to success is and in fact remains a secret, unfortunately. <laughs> Doesn't that seem like a waste of money? <laughs> they showed that amongst other things, coming from a top socioeconomic background it was not going to guarantee your success. And in fact, in most of the cases, it was quite the opposite. They showed that going to the best schools, going to, sorry, going to the best schools, going to the best universities, going to Harvard Business School would not guarantee success automatically. Having the highest IQ in this room wouldn't guarantee success. So what does? With 96% of their participants, there was a characteristic that they found common amongst them. And that characteristic was a significant predictor in that person's ability to achieve and sustain success. And it was this one thing. Grit. I'm going to lump a whole lot of words together now. Grit, perseverance, resolve, uh, resilience. They all mean slightly different things, but I'm just going to put them all in one for the time being. And I know, I think the Chinese word is E, right? Um, so if you look around you here, successful people, all of you, 96% of the people, chances are that they are sitting here because they have been able to show grit, resilience um, in their life. And I think it's, as a youngster growing up in today's world, you know, often they are not um, really exposed to much risk, obviously, because they're very young. But as they grow up, they're gonna start to realize that it's a world, it's a tough world, it's a harsh world. There's no great story, not one. And maybe you can tell me of one if you know one that doesn't come hand in hand with a bit of hardship. And so that's why resilience and growth is such an important thing. So I've had many opportunities as a professional adventurer um, to show grit and resilience. This is just a series of the last three expeditions that I've been on. Um, one of the ones I like the most was this one here. We, uh, did a trip from Cape Town in, in South Africa up to Central Africa. Um, most of the expedition was done in Rwanda, uh, mainly because we tried to trek a series of mountains and volcanoes uh, from northern Burundi up to uh, Uganda, DRC, northern um, Rwanda. And that series of mountains separated the Nile River from the Congo River. Never been done before. Um, it was an excellent expedition. Um, we were Unfortunately, not allowed to start in the area that uh, we were supposed to start in. I don't know if you know Rwanda. Um, it's a beautiful country. It's a, a very safe country to travel in, but it is surrounded by a lot of danger. Um, and when we arrived there, about a week before we arrived, the Burundian army had actually come in. There had been an in, um, incursion into Rwanda. There had been a firefight. A couple of people had been um, killed. And so we were actually forced to start our expedition a little bit further north. Um, but getting up to some of these volcanoes was uh, definitely one of the highlights of my life. Um, and then also, just one of the experiences we had on this, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this expedition, so I'm sorry I'm going through it quite quickly, but was to come face to face with a, a troop of gorillas, um, 
right out in the wild. And this is the silverback of the troop. He's a monster. His head is this big. Okay, um, he doesn't look as big as he looks um, now, but in real life, um, that's how big he is. And as we came into the clearing, um, there were about 55 of them in this troop. And as we came into this clearing, he said hello to us. And this is what he said. He went, <coughs> <coughs> which means, come to us, uh, it's absolutely fine. Uh, you guys are welcome here. Just don't do anything stupid. And we weren't going to do that, for sure. Um, but I don't know if you know this. I think they have something like 96% of human DNA inside them. Um, and we had a very tranquil hour with them. Um, and it was beautiful. It was a very humbling, very incredible moment of my um, life. And this is some of the kids that they had around there as well. Just, it was a, an, an incredible experience. And then in 2017, I did a mountain bike ride from uh, southern Angola down through the Namib Desert into southern Namibia. Also, just an incredible journey. And, and often, we believe in areas that very few people have set foot before. And lots of incredible lessons learned from that. 2015, uh, which was one of my last big ice expeditions, we tried to recreate an expedition in the style of Scott and Amundsen and Shackleton. I don't know if you know the the stories about them, but um, basically what they do was, in, in the old days they would train a whole lot of sled dogs, uh, huskies, um, malamutes, whatever it was, and they would put them on their ship and they would sail across an ocean, get to a big piece of ice, North Pole, South Pole, whatever, get onto the ice, do their expedition to whatever destination they were going to, and then come back and then put what's left of their dogs onto the ship, and I, I don't know if the Norwegians loved to eat their dogs in the old days. <coughs> that, that was actually part of the plan um, in the journey. And actually, I did this with a Norwegian um, explorer, and I said to him before the start, I said, listen, whatever happens, when we go on this journey, I'm coming back with my dogs. There's going to be no dog eating on that expedition. These are my two dogs that I've trained in Norway. Their names are Figaro and Pipling. And the reason why we chose green and sled dogs for this expedition was because of their size. They're much smaller than the huskies that they usually use um, on the sled, uh, on the big sled dog um, expeditions where they put 8 to 16 dogs um, in front of them. We were only going to take two dogs each. In fact, my Norwegian counterpart had three dogs, I had two. And I, the concept was that the dogs would be attached to me, I would be attached to the sled. So if the dogs and myself pull the sled, it's not that the dogs are pulling the sled and um, I'm just hanging on. So at some times when, when it was flat in the ice and things were good, I would just let the dogs pull the sled and then I would just ski um, next to the sled itself. And we would then, we'd then put them onto this boat over here. You can see the kennels in the front there. Um, and uh, sail across the Barents Sea from northern Norway, across the Barents Sea to Svalbard Island, which is situated about 82 degrees north, quite close to the North Pole. Um, but getting across the Bering Sea was going to be a little bit more tumultuous than we had originally anticipated. Um, this is us on our boat. This is a series of photographs taken by a Norwegian Coast Guard. And uh, they came up next to us, and we were very happy to see them. And they came up next to us in the storm, and the ship's captain got onto the radio, and a Norwegian basically said, What on earth are you guys doing here in the Bering Sea at this time of the year? And our response was, we're not 100% sure what we do in the very sea this time of year. Um, they said that we were the only other vessel in the sea at the time, and I think they were springboarding off us, um, because we obviously sounded uh, not as happy as they were. And uh, they said there was no other vessel in the sea. They were getting bored. They needed a little bit of entertainment, so they were going to use us as practice for the next few days, some training. And uh, it was good to have them with us in any case. A couple of weeks after the storm, we arrived in Svalbard Island. Do you like this photograph? It's beautiful, eh? It's really easy taking photographs when things are going well. <laughs> okay, when things are going pear shaped, it's a whole different story. We then got onto the ice like this and had that incredible expedition across this island. It was a, an amazing journey. Lots of, also, again, hard lessons learned. And six weeks later, our boat came to pick us up and we had that beautiful sail the Bering Sea to look forward to to get back to Norway. In 2008, I rode across the Atlantic Ocean with a good friend of mine, also from East London in South Africa, in a race. I 
okay, a rowing race across the Atlantic Ocean, 23 other boats taking part in it called the Woodvale Transatlantic Rowing Race. It's a five and a half thousand kilometer race. Uh, just to give you some idea, that's both the Canary Islands. From the Canary Islands, that's Morocco. These are the Cape Bird Islands and the Azores. So across the southern part of the North Atlantic Ocean to Antigua, five and a half thousand kilometers um, away. We rode this boat here. Yeah. Gorma Challenger, that's the name of the boat, so <coughs> for the word. In shift style. Now this is important for this talk, and I, I'm going to get you ready now to try and picture the sea, okay? The ships were an hour and a half on, and an hour and a half off. Okay, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for 50 days and 12 hours. Okay, so there wasn't one second on this road that one of us wasn't growing. 24 hours a day there was somebody on board, except for Christmas Day. And we were so excited about Christmas Day because we looked forward to this for weeks. On Christmas Day we were going to sit down together for a half an hour, nobody rowing, and eat our boil in the bag chicken and herb dumplings. Woo! Like, so, listen, if you get boil in the bag chicken and herb dumplings for Christmas, something's not good at home. <laughs> so, why were we excited about that? Um, up until this stage, we've been eating freeze-dried food, okay, mixed with olive oil. You may say, why olive oil? Well, to, in order to consume the amount of calories that we needed to sustain ourselves with, just to keep body weight, we had to increase it uh, quite dramatically. You can't actually sit and eat the amount of food that you need to eat and still row the amount that you need to row and rest, etc. So, 100 mils of olive oil, 900 kilocalories, 400 um, uh, so it's like a four or five course meal in one shot. So three or four times a day we'd have our little shot of olive oil and then the rest of the time we'd put uh, olive oil in our food. So I can't do olive oil anymore. Okay, I'm a little bit over <laughs> olive oil. So we do other things now, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so Billy and I won this race. There were 23 boats part taking part in the race, as I said. It was our decision from the very first moment that Bill and I had a conversation around this race um, and there was no doubt in our head that every second that we put into prepare, uh, preparing to do the race, we wanted to win it. We wanted to break the world record. This is day eight of the race. Um, Billy has just got off the phone. He had actually was speaking to uh, one of the radio um, producers down in South Africa and he had told us that we were in first position and this is the moment of finding out that we are in first position. We held that for another 42 days. Um, of the race. Adventurers love to tell you how much they suffer and how they struggle. They show you how they cut their arms off, etc., and fingers, whatever, pull teeth out with flies. I'm not going to do any of that tonight. But let me quickly tell you about one storm that we had on this road. We had four storms on this road. The last storm lasted four days. Um, and it was the last four days of the road, and we finished at midnight in the last night of that storm. And in that storm, the sea varied from one or two feet, and I went up and down. One or two feet to 12 meters. Okay, swells. Okay, these are not breaking waves like you'd see in Hollywood. Okay, I would love to tell you that. It's not as dramatic as that, but it is still quite dramatic. So there are massive swells wider than this room, probably uh, as high, maybe a little bit higher than the ceiling, um, traveling at high speeds across the ocean. And then if you look out at sea during a windy day, you'll see those white caps breaking. And at the top of these, which gives it this mighty look when, you know, when they're breaking, you'll have these white caps breaking six to eight feet, maybe sometimes bigger, breaking over the, over the boat. I guarantee you there's, there are very few places as terrifying as, terrifying as that, um, being on a little seven meter rowing boat in the middle of the ocean. But we finished our row at midnight on the last night of that four day storm. And, uh, when we got into Antigua, we, we rowed onto the leeward side of the island, so it's protected from the wind. And uh, as we got in, we had to row up this lagoon for about a kilometer and a half. And you've got to picture this Caribbean sea, uh, like sea, okay? So palm trees, lots of super yachts, other boats. People knew that we were arriving, so they were getting out on their boats, um, lighting flares, you know, like shouting, the, you know, their congratulations, whatever, as we were coming past. But our families were, uh, right at the end of this lagoon um, on the quayside and most of the island had come down to see us coming in, a small island, and I think they were quite, quite concerned about what they were going to find, or, or maybe even uh, interested in what they were going to find. It's a bit like watching um, the F1 
Formula One and looking out for those accidents. I think we were that accident arriving. And um, as we came up to the quay, I got off, I could hardly stand, and the very first person um, that I grabbed was uh, my beautiful wife, Kim, and uh, I put my arms around her and I said, Kim, oh, that's not Kim. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, and it's just, the life in South Africa is tough, eh? <laughs> so let me just say that Billy and I had an incredible journey together. Um, we made a pact together before the start of this race, and I think it was one of, the, one of the real things that enabled us to do this race successfully, and it's something that I do with every expedition that I go on, and with every expedition partner that I do an expedition with. Um, and let me say again as well, that, that two, three days, into a row with uh, another man on a seven meter rowing boat, the mystery goes very quickly and the layers get stripped off very, very quickly. And it's an interesting um, place to be in. It's an in interesting dynamic. Okay, case, so I grabbed my beautiful wife, Kim, and I put my arms around her, and I think some of you have met Kim before. I put my arms around her and I say, Kim, if I ever say that I want to do something like this again, okay, you absolutely have to stop me, okay, please. <laughs> So I'm full of wild ideas all the time. She, she looked at me, she's quite a feisty woman, and she said, Pete, don't worry, I absolutely will. So let's fast forward quickly. Back in South Africa after the race, um, 10 days later, I'm starting to think, geez, um, you know, what's the next expedition? No African at that stage had ever rowed any ocean solo before, so this starts going through my mind. And after a couple of weeks of thinking about that, I decided to chat to Kim about it. Um, and it's quite an honest conversation because I remember the promise she made to me. Anyway, so I get home one day and I say, Kim, there's something you and I need to chat about. And we sit down and uh, we start talking about doing this next row solo. And uh, I take my hat off to Kim because at the end of the conversation, she looked at me and she said, you know what, Pete? You must go and do this row. I'll never, ever stop you from achieving that dream and that vision that you have for your life. Because for me to do so would to diminish you as a person. She said, go for it, but be warned. I was there for an amazing life. That's why she's right at the top of my team that I'm with. And so two years later, I'm on my new boat. And once again, I rode in the same race, <coughs> hour and a half on, hour and a half off. Except when I went off for the hour and a half, there was nobody keeping the boat going in the right direction. <coughs> so that boat would be left to the wind and the current and to see in whatever nature could throw at me. And it was the toughest part of the journey. And I did that 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 76 days. Now they say, if you want to know yourself, truly know yourself, spend 24 hours in complete isolation. And then try 76. I guarantee you there's not a single person sitting in this room, not one of you, that would not learn a great deal about themselves after having spent 76 days alone in a rowing boat in the ocean. And if you had to say to me, and it's a question I get asked a lot, Pete, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned? Put all your expeditions together, come out at the end with one, what would it be? I'd have to say this, that the greatest lesson that I've learned is that you and I have been incredibly well made. <laughs> Physically, and mentally much better than we will ever, ever begin to imagine. But we will only ever discover that, only ever discover that, because it's where I've discovered it. When we are completely out of our comfort zones, when we are faced by moments of imminent disaster, when we are faced where our lives may be snapped out just like that, and we manage to come right. And it's only those times that we begin to realize how well we've been made. Because we are able to overcome them. And then the next, and then the next, and then the next. So the first thing that I always start off with when I speak is, we've got to begin to understand who we are and what we're capable of achieving. Because absolutely we are capable of, and you'll get lots of inspirational speakers saying exactly the same thing. And you can do anything. And you know what? You can. But the real truth is, is that the only way you will ever be able to um, achieve those things that are impossible is if you put the right process in place. 
and if you are prepared to put up with incredible hardship on that journey. That is the secret to it. Because as we grow up, as the kids are growing up right now, they are faced by a world where they don't want to have hardship. They don't understand that hardship is an absolute ingredient for achieving anything great in life. And that there are certain things that we can use to overcome those tough times. Are we able to achieve anything? Absolutely. The impossible? Absolutely. Why not? Terms and conditions apply though. So, that great boxer, Muhammad Ali, um, once said, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men, women, who find it easier to live in a world that they've been given and to explore the power that they have to change it. Possible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Possible is temporary. Possible is nothing. I was that for a man who's been hit on the head so many times? I jest. But his words are so true. Well, um, six days, sorry, a couple of, six weeks after the only storm that I experienced on this road lasted six days and um, six days, five nights, I rode across the finish line. And this is the moment of running across that finish line. I love this photograph for many reasons. One, the minus 18 kilograms of body weight here. And as you can see, I'm quite a skinny guy. It's pretty much like a prisoner of war at the time. But underneath my boat right there, I have six fish living with me. Six Dorado. Have you heard of Dorado? Okay, in other parts of the world they're called mahe mahe, or dolphin fish. And the reason why they call them in some parts of the world dolphin fish is because they're so clever. They are the only fish in the sea that make for life. Isn't that incredible? I had six of them live underneath my boat for six weeks. Okay, I'm going to come out of some kind of weird closet right now. I had a relationship with six fish. And those six fish helped me get to the finish line. And I'm going to tell you a great story about them a little bit later. And don't worry, I am okay. And you can see some great footage about this as well if you go into my website. The documentary of this is called Not Alone. And there's some amazing footage um, of my interaction with these fish. Um, but later for that. I'll never forget, this is a, a couple of hours later, because this is the finish line. We had to still row into that lagoon on the other side of the island. And um, as I get into the lagoon, I get up on the quayside. I grab my wife again, and I say, Kim. If I ever say, I want to do this again, please, you know, stop me. And she looked at me again and she said, Pete, don't worry, I absolutely will. So now, let's fast forward again You're back in South Africa. I'm starting to think about the next expedition. And Kim comes to me and she says, Pete, you owe me. I said, of course, Kim, I owe you. Like, what can I do? She says, no, no. She said, the next expedition is mine. I said, okay, that's fantastic. So she ran from our house, which is in the coast of South Africa, right up to Mozambique, which is about 1,200 kilometers, a marathon a day, then mountain bike the inland borders of South Africa, across Africa, about 3,200 kilometers, um, onto a river that is also one of the borders of um, South Africa and Namibia, kayaked 615 kilometers to the west coast of South Africa, put her running shoes back on, and ran another 2,400 kilometers back home. A journey of 6,700 kilometers in one shot. And you think, I'm oh, nuts. <laughs> Welcome to our family. I was getting my daughter Hannah uh, a while ago to do a mountain bike uh, race, and she's quite sedentary. I don't know where she gets that gene from. And uh, she was grumbling under her breath while she was packing her bag. She said something like, if only I had been born into a normal family, this, <laughs> this would never have happened. Um, I like in Africa, it's tough, man. Any case, during Kim's expedition, I get a phone call from a good friend of mine, Brahm Malhoba. Now, Brahm, incidentally, is one of the two explorers that have run the entire length of the, great, the main Great Wall of China, which is 4,300 kilometers um, from east to west. He did that in uh, 2006. He ran 89 consecutive marathons. A marathon a day for 89 days in Thailand. An incredible person. He phones me up and he says, Pete, I have an opportunity to go down to Antarctica to take part in an international race to the South Pole 
to commemorate the first two people ever to get there exactly 100 years ago. And if you know the story, the first person to get to the South Pole was Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer. He arrived there in December 1911. And 35 days later, Sir Robert Falcon Scott, the British naval explorer, uh, naval officer and explorer, arrived with his team. They were extremely broken people. By the time they got to the South Pole, they found the Norwegian tent and the Norwegian flag flying with a very simple note that, um, that Amundsen had cheaply left for him to to take back just in case Amundsen didn't um, arrive back um, in Norway. And uh, Scott and his team were devastated and on their return journey to their ship, um, him and his whole team perished. In fact, they perished about three nautical miles away from one of the last food points that they had set out um, in the preparation for their final journey to the South Pole. It's a long story, but it's an incredible story if you ever want to um, read about them. So Brahm in the same breath says, and so Pete, we are doing the centenary race. We're going to follow in their footsteps. Do you want to be part of that team? I said, Brahm, are you completely nuts? Of course I want to be part of that team. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't? But as, as you know, I have never done anything in the ice before. I don't know how to ski. We've only got three months to go before the start of this race. It's not enough time to prepare ourselves well enough to go and win this race. I also have a little bit of a competitive gene in me. And I said, so, so long as we can, in the next three months, um, prepare ourselves, just do acclimatization, learn how to ski, cross-country ski properly, I'm in. And so for the next three months, we spent time in Iceland, doing a polar survival course in Iceland, and the whole time that we were there, it was pretty much a blizzard. We were up at a glacier called Longical Glacier, which, is, which means long glacier, at three and a half thousand meters above sea level. It was dangerous conditions because of the uh, crevasses in this, in this glacier. So we didn't do a lot of skiing, but it was really good to do all the tent routines uh, for the weeks that we were there. The rest of the time, we pulled tires up and down our coastline just like this. And often when people see this photograph, they say, Rob, Pete, you don't need to show this photo to us. We know the wheels came off you guys a long time ago. <laughs> and then we got onto this Russian Aleutian aircraft in Cape Town, South Africa, and flew down to the Russian Novo base with all seven other teams that were taking part in the race. And when we got there, we had Three beautiful days, nice and warm, kind of minus five, minus 10 degrees. But the best thing about this time was that there was no wind. So it gave us an opportunity to repack all our food. Now that food that you see there is all food mixed with, does anybody want to guess? Oh. Ah, remember I said I can't do olive oil anymore. So that food is mixed with butter. Woo. Now butter is amazing because it's got three different flavors. Olive oil is olive. Okay, butter, you've got normal butter, you've got herb butter, you've got garlic butter. And it's kind of got the same calorie count as olive oil. So now, this food that you see there is all dried meat mixed with normal butter, mixed with herb butter, um, nuts and raisins crushed up, mixed with normal butter, etc. And we had one tent routine every single day. Uh, so we would trek for 16 hours a day, um, and then we would have a eight, eight hour uh, tent routine. So two hours up, rest for four hours and two hours down again. Um, that's kind of how it worked. Once we left the Russian Novo base, we would trek to the start line of the rest um, in an area that we considered or deemed to be safe um, to start. And we trekked with all seven other teams. These are two um, important teams to remember during this race. That is the Norwegian team. One of these people, I'm not sure which one it is, in this photograph was the person I did that expedition uh, to Svalbard with. They were out to show that it was right for the Norwegians to be first to the North Pole exactly 100 years ago. This is the British team. They were out to show that it should have been the Brits who got to the Pole first 100 years ago. There's a great debate about it um, in the adventure world, whether Amundsen should have left Scott to the, his original expedition, but I'm not going to get into that. With our three months of training and with these pro teams racing against us, guess who we hung out with on the journey to the start line? these teams. And had it not been from the Brits and from the Norwegians and the stuff that we learned from them, I'm not so sure I'd be standing here with all my extremities intact as they are. Um, it took us 10 days to ski to the start line, also trekking 16 hours a day. Antarctica is an amazing place. Um, this is, once you get from the sea ice level, you go through a whole mountain range to get up 
um, to the high plateau. That high plateau in Antarctica starts at 3,200 meters. The highest point on that plateau is 4,600 meters above sea level. The South Pole is at 3,500 meters. Because of its altitude, it makes it colder than the North Pole, not as dangerous, uh, but definitely colder than the North Pole. The coldest temperature ever measured was minus 89 degrees centigrade without wind chill factor, and that was at the Russian Vostok station. That plateau, that what you're looking at right there, is greater in area than the United States of America. It's a big piece of ice at the bottom of our planet. That's why the study of climate change in Antarctica is such an important thing. Then the race organizers uh, drew, drew a line of the ice and snow. This is actually a photograph taken from some footage. That's why the quality is not great. They uh, took out a rifle. They let off a shot. And they said, sayonara chaps, we'll see you at the South Pole. As you see it there, seven international teams, the least prepared team, was Brahm and I, not because it's not a bragging point, we only had three months to train for this race. Um, the next least prepared team had trained for two years to do this race. Some of the guys with big budgets had been down to Antarctica to train, and most of these guys, because they live in the Northern Hemisphere, deep in the Northern Hemisphere, had been to the North Pole before, so um, they were avid polar explorers. On day five of the race, there were just three teams standing. Just three. Uh, we didn't know it. Um, and Brahm and I were one of those um, three teams. So how do we do it? And this, I come now to my, my second point that I want to speak about. And I think this is probably for me one of the most valuable points um, that I always think about. Um, and that is, and I love this photograph, because that is Antigua Island in the background. This is 20 nautical miles. Are we able to dim these lights quickly? the light dimmer up there. No. Um, just because I want to see one or two things that are slightly clearer. Um, my eyes are sunken deep in the back of my head in this photograph. This is at the end of four days of not a single, if you can't, don't worry about it. This is at the end of four days of not a single second sleep. Okay? Now, it, I, I know and I've known what it's like not to sleep for 48 hours. Before. But once you move into 72 hours of no sleep and 96 hours of no sleep, things are changing dramatically inside your head. It's a beautiful place to be. It can also be an extremely dangerous place to be. After seven days of no sleep, generally speaking, your body will shut down and you will not survive anything further than seven days of no sleep. Um, to get to this point over here, it took a huge amount of suffering. To get to this point over here, took a huge amount of EV, of perseverance, of grit. But perseverance cannot and does not exist in a vacuum. You can't just persevere. There's got to be, there has to be something that stimulates perseverance. Why I do what I do. The best way that I can explain that word passion is by giving an example. Put yourself on that seat, right there. Try and picture the scene now. It's you. It's three o'clock in the morning. It's pitch black outside. You're rowing. You're on horse. Your hands are raw and blistered to the bone, almost. You'll see pictures just now. You've got pressure sores and salt sores, like boils, on your backside. You will not see pictures just now. <laughs> Those are all very special friends. <laughs> You've got salt sores everywhere where the sun doesn't shine. You're lonely. You're exhausted. There's a little red gremlin sitting on your shoulder. And we've all known this voice, and it's speaking to you. And what it's telling you right now is, Pete, don't be completely nuts. Finish this shift. Get into that gun. Pull the oars in right now. Get out of those rain shoes, get back in that cabin, and rest until the sun comes up. When the sun comes up, get on your satellite phone, get a hold of um, the Falmouth Marine Rescue Service Centre in the UK, and get them to get a ship, the closest ship, to come and pick you up and get you the hell out of there. Because what you're doing is nuts, seriously. This is a voice, remember. We all know this voice. 
And it's giving me reasons why I must do that. And they're good reasons. They're classic reasons. Crystal clear. Saying to me, Pete, to do another 24 hours like this is physically impossible. Might as well stop now. Pete, if you go through another storm, you may not see Kim again. You may not hold Hannah's hand down the aisle one day when she gets married. When she's 40 years old. <laughs> See, those are all good reasons. I mean, there are other things as well. The only thing that will allow you to finish that shift, to get into that cabin and rest for exactly 90 minutes, not a minute longer, and get back out there, put that backside back on the seat, pull those hands around the oars, out your lip until you get used to it, and row for another hour and a half is, how much do you want to do it? That is the thing that drives you, and that is the best way I can explain that word passion. Passion ultimately becomes more important than perseverance itself. And again, passion is not something that you can just create. It is not in a vacuum, again. It comes from purpose. And I'm not going to get into this too much tonight. Because purpose is definitely tiered for me. Personal purpose is personal purpose is professional purpose. But for me, right at the top of the personal purpose thing is survival. Okay, and I think it is for all of us. We can have a debate about this, but I'm not going to get into that now. But one of the things that I, and is very close to my heart is a, a group called, and I'm going to chat about it later as well, called Children in the Wilderness. It's something that I work with that educate children that are born in really rural parts of Africa that are born in wilderness areas that have to coexist with dangerous animals like elephant, um, lion, leopard, etc. They have to farm with them. Um, and instead of killing the animals, um, they can co-work co with them, etc. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Probably one of the best ways we'll ever conserve um, these wilderness areas um, in southern Africa. In your journeys, you're going to suffer, and I speak metaphorically here, especially to the kids. Don't worry too much about this. You're not going to get frostbite, I don't think, unless you really go into the journey. This is proper frostbite. This is starting to get down to the bone. These are the, the hands. They're not my hands, okay, because my hands wouldn't look like that if they were. These are the guys that came second in the race to the South Pole. This is a photograph also taken from footage of them at the halfway mark, about halfway. We saw them at the end. Their hands were wrapped up. Um, they obviously had to be operated. This is a couple of weeks before the end. We still had weeks to go. Um, we saw them six months later in London at the um, prize giving, and when we shook hands with them, the handshakes were a little bit shorter than they had been prior to the start. So why am I showing these things? I think just very basically, so that we get an understanding that no great story ever told doesn't come, so to speak, hand in hand, um, with a little bit of hardship. Minorata, there's also great stories. I've got, I could speak here for days about them, but let me just quickly tell you about these Dorado. Every sunrise and sunset after that six-day storm, which happened in the middle of the race in the solar road, I noticed these fish underneath my boat. And at every sunrise and sunset, they would jump out the water. It started off like meters away, so maybe even further than that away from me. I didn't know what they were doing. They were just fish jumping out the water. And as the weeks went past, I realized that the relationship that I was having with these fish was changing, and then in fact there was a relationship, and that these fish were actually trying to communicate with me. And I realized this when, for the first time, one of the fish jumped out really close to the boat, and they looked at me. Okay. But not like this, because they can't do that. It's like this, with one eye, right? <laughs> Just like that. Boom, they look really stupid if they try to look at you. <laughs> So, and, I, and I started working out that these guys were, over a couple of days, that these guys were actually communicating with me. Because if I wasn't on deck during that sunset or sunrise um, time, if I was resting during that time, they would jump out the water and they would hit their bodies hard against the water. Bam, bam, bam. All smoked my rudder and hit my rudder hard. Bam, bam, bam. Until I got out, until I made eye contact with them, they wouldn't stop. Isn't that incredible? <coughs> That's my version of it. Okay. <laughs> so, and and, and I, like every time I would jump, this is a, and I'd jump off the boat and I'd have a swim with them. Amazing. They would just swim around me in circles and just keep an eye on me the whole time. There's a disconnect between humans and animals. 
um, that we've lost, uh, and it's a connection we've lost many, many years ago, mainly because we eat them. I don't know if you've eaten Dorado before, they are delicious fish. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a disconnect mainly because of that uh, reason, and I've had such an incredible privilege to be able to reconnect with um, different parts of nature and different um, expeditions. Do you know the sea is full of bioluminescence? Have you ever, knew, ever experienced this? You go out at sea at night, and uh, bioluminescence is a phosphoretic kind of plankton. And that plankton, um, if you touch it at night, it touches like this, lights up to this bright green color, like, you know you get those luminous sticks that you break, that kind of green, and it's, it looks exactly like that. And that sea sometimes is so full of that bioluminescent uh, plankton, that when you do your draw stroke through the water like this, and at the end you've got that swirl, that swish, instead of it going swish like that, it goes like falls, like oil. And that is because of the plankton in the water. And that plankton lights up to this bright green color. So each swirl, for as far as you can see, which is not far because you're in the water, lights up to this bright, bright green color. And it, specifically when the water got like this, like lots, this is in the middle of the ocean. As you would lift your oars up at night, and as the water would drip into that, you would see the little splashes. And they would light up, each little drop would light this bright green color. And those Dorado would sit in this bioluminescent tank and light up like these bright, bright green torpedoes. And they would cross sides, and they would just sit exactly underneath my oars. Or they would go off and hunt flying fish and come back as an incredible part of the journey. One of the things that I also speak about and one of the great lessons I've learned is that whenever things are going bad, it's going bad for everybody else as well. Not always, but in a race like this particularly. And there are things that we can do to take advantage of the bad stuff that's happening around us, where our competitors may not. In the first race with Billy, every single storm, because we had four storms, every single storm that we got into, we would shorten our rest period down to half an hour, which meant we still rode for an hour and a half, but in that hour and a half, we would row together for an hour, and then a half an hour alone, and then a half an hour rest, every time. While our competitors were battening the hatches, putting out the parachute anchors, or putting out a drogue, a shoot, a drogue shoot, it looks like a windsock, a big windsock, that you would uh, hang off the back of your boat on the road, Basically what it does is slows the boat down, makes it very safe so that the waves break over the back of the boat and don't turn you over sideways. But to do that took an incredible amount of discipline because our hands were like they were. Our buttocks were like they were. If you double up on your ship to go from rowing 12 hours a day to 18 or 20 hours a day, it took a huge amount of discipline. This is a photograph taken um, during one of the storms um, Billy um, got out quickly to take this photograph. It's uh, not a position. You can actually see his knees sitting in the hatch there. Um, I'm holding the oars down like that, although it's holding them down, the, the tops of the oars are sticking as far up as they can out of the water. I'm about to brace for another wave that's just about to break um, over the boat during the time. Also, one of the things that we learned was when we got those big squalls, and those squalls would last any, anywhere from half an hour up to four, five, six hours. Um, and what a lot of the guys would do as well is batten hatches, get inside, wait for it to calm down, and then get back out again. We had our shampoo next to us. Uh, and every time we see a storm coming, we'd put some shampoo in our hair over there and wait for it to come, and the storm would come and go, and we'd be nice and fresh off. And uh, on the odd occasion, uh, very rarely, but on the odd occasion, we'd get the shampoo, put it in our hair, and the storm would come, and it would just move off. And we'd be sitting there with the shampoo in our hair. So there's certain things that we can do. I, I don't know what it is in your lives. Then challenge it now. What are we doing right now um, that I could do better at? Be 
better at tomorrow. And it's, a, it's something that I... We worked out that could we have shortened this into the main area of the savings? If we could have shortened it down to 40 minutes as well and used the 80 minutes for trekking, we would have beaten the Norwegians. They beat us by seven days. One thing. What can we do to make us better at what we do? And I love telling the story. Uh, these are two British Royal Marines that we met in the first race across Antarctica. They were the biggest guys um, in the race by far. Some of the biggest men I've ever met in my life, actually. They walked around the island, they were going to win the race, they were going to break the world record. There was no other boat they considered were the adversaries in this race. Um, and they looked the part, they had the best boat, etc. They came up to us, now picture the scene again, 23 little boats sitting next to each other. They came up next to us two hours before the start of the race. They shook hands with us, they said, Bill Pete, as you know, we're both British Royal Marines. Uh, when we get to Antigua on the other side, we've got duties to go to in Afghanistan, Iraq, I can't remember where they said. But basically... When we get in, we're going to have to go off immediately, so by the time you guys get in, we'll probably be gone, so we want to say goodbye to you. How's that? Isn't that amazing? And they said, but don't worry, um, here's something to remind you of us. And uh, they gave us one of their juice bottles. You know those things that you put on a bicycle? Exactly one of those, the longer bottle, about 750 balls. Um, you know them? You know what I'm talking about. Um, and they had... On the bottle, it was a white bottle, there's the name of the boat here, you can't, you can't actually read it. The name of the boat was Go Commando, and that was all that was on the bottle. So we shook hands with them, we said thank you very much, we wished them well. And uh, we put that boat um, in the cabin on our, on our boat. So we got on the boat, put it in the cabin, not realizing how important that bottle was going to become to us later on in the road. Now I'm sorry we we're going with this um, question. One of the kids in the earlier session said, he asked a question, he said, so how did you go to the toilet um, when you were on this road? So here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> so two days into this row, we realized that going to the toilet over the side of the boat was taking too much time. Because this is how it works. You can picture whatever you want out of the seat as well. Okay, so what? You need to go to the toilet, you've got to pull the oars in, strap them together. Okay? You've got to get out of your rowing shoes, get to the side of the boat, get it done, back on the seat, feet back in the shoes. All's out again, three minutes, minimum. Person who's not rowing um, has got to stand on the side of the boat, the side of the boat's like this. Person who's rowing can't row anymore, it's another three minutes. We quickly worked out that this wasn't working for us. We needed to change it, um, enter the Go Commando juice bottle. <laughs> so now we can sit in our seat <laughs> and get it done and throw it over the side of the boat. Without, uh, and it just took a whole lot, uh, it was a lot quicker. The person who wasn't right could stand in the middle of the boat and get it done without disturbing the person who's, although it's a bit disturbing for the person who's right, because they watch the whole thing. But then again, the mystery has gone after a couple of days, so it doesn't really matter in the end. So, and throw it over the boat. So here we are, we're saving about three nautical miles a day just on this one thing. In one day, it's not far, but 50 days becomes a little bit more significant. Ten days before the race finishes. We are in first position. Oh, by the way, that bottle is perfect for two reasons. One, 750 milliliters seem to be the perfect amount to contain in one go. And two, those bottles have got nice, you know those bottles, they've got a nice, uh, easy access point. So that would be a little bit of a struggle. <laughs> uh, so 10 days before the race finishes, we're in first position. A boat called No Fear is 30 nautical miles behind us. This boat here, Go Commando, is 150 nautical miles behind us in third position. Our satellite phone breaks. We now go dead to the rest of the world, flip on the screen. The next time we speak to anybody is in Antigua on our radio. We get to Antigua, we find out we're still in first position. No Fear is now 24 nautical miles behind us. Go Commando is five days behind. Fallen further back, but still in third position. 
So that night we celebrate. Remember, we arrive at midnight. The next day we come down to the boat. We've got three days on the island. We want to clean the boat up, get it into the container, and spend two and a half days having a couple of pina coladas before we leave. And uh, as we get to the boat, we stand on the boat. The boat does this, and guess what? Rolls over the deck. The go commander juice spot. And it dawns on us. We are not going to be there in five days' time when they arrive. We need to leave them something to remind them of us. <laughs> Can you see where we're going with this thing? <laughs> so we take the bottle, we wash it out as much as we can, we get a permanent marker pen and we write in it, Dear Ben, Orlando, well done for the great race, all the best, Bill and Pete, and we left it with the race organizers to get them five days later when they arrive. And Bill and I often get together, and one of the things we talk about, laugh about, is whether they use that bottle or not, <laughs> or whether they smelt a rat. <laughs> and I think it was the latter. But here's the thing. This was just one small little thing that we did. If we hadn't have done it, we would have lost the race. That's not the dream. That's not the vision. So what is it that we can do every day to make us better at what we do? doesn't matter how old we go. There is something. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be something that becomes a culture in our lives. This is going to end, like this talk. I had two things written on my, my hat in front of me, on my bulkhead, and they're kind of mantras in my life. I like them a lot. The first one is this will end, and uh, I just knew that whenever I was uh, in a current, a head current of two knots or whatever it was, I knew that in a few days' time it would end, and that I would just need to struggle it out for those few days. And what I did in that time would determine how I end. Um, that particular struggle, or that storm, or whatever it is, it is going to end. Um, and the second thing is, I'm never alone, ever. And that, and I, and I haven't had time to speak about it this evening, is because I have made such an important, well, one of the biggest things in my life is that I've been able to build this incredible team of people around me, and it's, it's one of the greatest reasons um, I have been able to achieve what I've been able to achieve. And that is why um, my... My movie is called Not Alone, because it's not about me. It's never about me. I mean, I know that I'm the one rowing across an ocean. But it is the collective effort of so many people, and so many people's influence on my life as I've grown up uh, to where I am right now. So, this is some footage of both of these rows.
um, it's not. So I use my expeditions to raise funds for, for um, children in the wilderness, um, as I said, and I've explained a little bit about it. I'm not going to get into it too much now. But if you had said to me, so give me one reason why you do what you do. I'd say I do what I do because that is the vision that I have for my life. But it's obviously, again, tears underneath all of that. However, when I'm sitting on my sled, and I don't know if I'm going to live the next two hours out, or if I'm in my rowing boat in a storm and I don't know if I'm going to live that storm out, I don't think about children in the wilderness, I don't think about my dream, I don't think about my vision, I don't think about any of those things. I think about this one thing. I think about that team of people that I've surrounded myself with. And that is why I believe that whole survival thing is such an important part of purpose in our lives. I think, what would those people say to me right now to get me up, to get me going, to put things in place right now to get me to survive, to get me back home again? And ultimately, that is the thing that motivates me to do what I do. Kim and Hannah wrote little notes for me um, on the journey to the South Pole, not the road. And I actually got this quite close to the South Pole. Um, it was one of the little notes that they left in my day bag. And she said, Pete, when you get to that point that it's too painful and too difficult for you to do it for yourself, then do it for us. So let me leave that there. I've got a plane to catch in a few hours' time. Um, but let me leave one more thing with you. If I see you one day and you see me, I may not recognize you. I probably won't. Sit me down and tell me a story. I know there are a hundred great stories sitting here right now, this evening. Thank you very much for your time. It's been great speaking to you. Uh, thanks, Web, again, for the invite. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah? Does anybody want to ask me something urgently? <laughs> if, even if it's not urgent. Can I ask a question? Yes, no. Let's see where you go. Where do you go poo? <laughs> where do I go poo? Is the question. Okay, I'm going to show you exactly where I go poo. See that bucket over there? Not that bucket, okay, that's, that's the up one from me. So that's the one that I use to go out to. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's a very special place, that. If, if you were visioning like this, it interests me. Of, if you, from the start to finish, how would you break down the percentages? What bit you enjoy and what bit you don't enjoy? <laughs> if you like 30, 70, 28, 50, 50? That's a really good question. Um, I often get back from an expedition that, that, that people say, hey Pete, yes, you must have really enjoyed that. <sighs> well, that must have been lots of fun. Mm. It was nice finishing. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, there are incredible moments, but generally speaking, in something like this, you're suffering most of the time. Um, and I, I think a lot, of, a lot of the enjoyment comes from being able to overcome that. Um, and there are moments, obviously, that are beautiful. Um, so I would say 80-20. Which way around? Suffering. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's really, but that finish line, you know, when you uh, are able to achieve what you set out to achieve, there is pretty much no greater feeling on the planet. But Pete, if you're not won the race, would it have been different? If I had not won the race, the yeah, first race. Yeah, yeah. Would it have been different? Been different if we had, if, oh, and you know, one of the, the things that I speak about is pressing the snooze button and we just haven't had time. So if I had, if I had during that journey not been disciplined and, um, and had done something that I believe had caused me to not come first in the race, it would be different. But if I had pulled, put my 100% in it and had been supremely disciplined during my journeys, which I am, um, I, I would have been happy, but obviously um, not as happy. I would imagine just like the British felt after the South Africans beat them in the World Cup. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> yes. from her and from women like her? Sure. 
Uh, okay, so let me speak about Kim first. Uh, I'm really hoping to bring her here next time, so maybe Rab will open the doors for Kim. She has, she's an amazing speaker. She has an incredible story. Um, um, the person who's done the most rowing in the world, that has covered the most oceans, um, is a woman by the name of Ros Savage. Um, so you can always go onto her website to find out um, more about her. An incredible person. There are quite a few women adventurers. Um, yeah, Kim's, uh, my wife, Kim's also got a website. You can go onto her website. It's just her name, kimpunkets.com. So yeah, there are lots of places where um, you can see that. It's not just the domain of men, for sure. <coughs> yes, young man. Very quickly, very badly. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let me show you. So this is the cabin here. Okay, it's a small place. Um, so you've got a little mattress inside there, and that's where you sleep. It's pretty much as long as you are, and it's probably about that deep. So you slide into it, a bit like a coffin. <laughs> it's nicer. <laughs> so I haven't eaten Dorado for hmm, a very long time, so at least 10 years. <laughs> so I, I don't think I'd ever be able to eat Dorado again. I know they're just fish, but when you have a relationship with something, it's hard to eat them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Your, your adventures, you, uh, without being, uh, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> question I get asked a lot of the time, um, and I am still very young, <laughs> so I'm 52, I'm, years, I'm, 50, yeah, yeah, I'm 52 years old, I think as we get older, let me just answer that one quickly, uh, as we get older, I think our ability to overcome um, many of the issues that life throws at us becomes a lot easier because of our experience, um, and uh, I physically have never been stronger than I am right now. Um, and every year since I turned 40 has been exactly the same. Just have got stronger and stronger and stronger physically and mentally. And um, it's just because I'm constantly training and constantly doing stuff that takes me out of my comfort zone and out of the, um, areas that I'm comfortable in. You know? um, so, and I think my message for, for young people is exactly what I've, and you know, I've had to choose very carefully what I've what I was going to speak about tonight. Um, it's quite difficult speaking to people that are very young and, and my age. So these, those are the most important things, is that nothing good in life comes without struggle. And really, nothing great comes in life without suffering. So our ability to overcome that um, is going to be the ticket for us um, as we grow older. Complicated world out there, you know. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay, yes, yes. Okay, so, um, so there wasn't a significant thing. I think all of us have a spirit of adventure inside of us. I think we all, whatever it is we do, whether we're doctors or whether we've got our own businesses, whether you're a CEO of a business, whether you're a student, or whatever it is, I think we um, have all got that spirit of adventure inside us, whatever we're doing. And there came a point in my life um, when actually I did that first row, where it was going to take up too much of my time to, to work, and um, to go on an expedition like that. That took two years of full-time um, preparation. And so Kim and I had a conversation around it uh, two years before that row, and we decided that it, it would be okay that it would work, and um, I've just made it work um, after that. So I've been able to use what I'm doing uh, to create a life around it. <coughs> it's not been easy. Uh, How about as a teenager? Yeah. My, 
I grew up. <coughs> Sorry to dwell on that. No, that's fine. Yeah. I'm just going <coughs> to. I grew up in the Namibia as a quite a wild part of Southern Africa. So as a young boy, I was <coughs> really exposed to wild environments, and uh, every every opportunity that was that came my way to get out and to go and do something um, different, I took. You know? um, so, youngsters, if you have an opportunity at any of the schools that you go to, um, to go camping, to go climbing, to go rafting, to do whatever it is. Um, and you'll be surprised what adventure can do for you. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. One more? Yeah. Uh, let's try. Yes. How do you make a living? How do I make a living? That's a good question. So, <clears throat> so I, I, I do a lot of work with um, uh, business people. I speak at a lot of conferences. I speak at sort of between 60 and 80 conferences a year. Um, now this time I've just been uh, brought up by Beijing Benz, a motor company, um, and I'm part of a, I speak at part of a leadership program that they have, and this is my third time up here, so that's kind of where I make my bread and butter. I've also written a book, I'm busy with my second one now. We've made television documentaries that have kind of paid for um, big expeditions before, so, in a nutshell, that's where I'm, I mainly make my money from. So I don't get a big sponsor like Nike that pays me lots of money just to be. Um, if you know anybody that would like to do that for me, please let me know. <laughs> okay, let me leave that there. I've got to get to the airport as well. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>